Welcome to Trailer Rewind, everyone. Every month we dig into the archives and view a film that Pete and Andy talked about in their trailer picks on the mothership. JJ and I watch it and have a very spoilery conversation about it. Today we're going to be looking at The Two Faces of January. This was Andy's pick from February 27th, 2014. There's a young guy in a gray shirt staring at me. She's very pretty, isn't she? What are you doing, Athens? I'm a tour guide. You're American. You believe me? You can ask him yourself. He's going to show us around the flea market Sunday. What do you do for a living, sir? I uh, look after people's savings. Hey, why don't you uh, join us for dinner? <laughs> so, what'd you think? Wouldn't trust him to mow my lawn. I thought you said no one would follow us. We got to get out of here right away. I went back and listened, and Andy said that he was drawn to this because it had that same feel as the talented Mr. Ripley, which was sure. also based on a novel written by Patricia Highsmith. And he also mm-hmm. mentioned that writer-director Hossein Amini also wrote Drive, which he enjoyed quite a bit. So, JJ, tell me whether we are two different sides of the coin on this one. I watched it just this weekend, so I, I, I did have to start it twice. I got into a place in about the 20-minute mark, for me, actually, where I got kind of woozy with it, and it was uh, actually one of the parts with the subtitles, so I think that might be part of the, the place where I needed to bring more attention to it. But watching it again and going through it all, I, I, I'm not a person that's actually seen uh, t- the talented Mr. Ripley uh, start to finish. I've seen bits and pieces of it, and I know lots <laughs> of people love all the drama and everything with it. Um, one of the things that's difficult for me about The Two Faces of January is really sort of picking a side, finding a protagonist, finding a hero in the mix. And that was really difficult for me in this one. Um, and so it made it hard for me to like the movie. That being said, I think it's a really strong film, especially thinking that it's uh, Amini's first director. It's his first direction. He's he's written Drive and done that stuff, but this is the first time that he's felt compelled to direct a film. I, th- I think it's really strong. I think there's some really strong camera work and some some strong stuff to that, but the story itself was really difficult for me, and I don't think it's a bad story. I just think the fact that it's all about all these characters who are so fundamentally flawed, right? Everyone is supposed to be well-rounded in that they are positive and negative and, and, and very strong, uh, tough but real, I guess is what I would say. That makes it a tough thing for me to like in, in particular, and I found myself kind of wondering where I felt through most of the film. And that and that's a difficult place for me to be in. So I, I think it's a it's a good movie uh, to check out if you like this sort of drama and the sort of uh, all characters being somewhat negative uh, in some respect. But for me, uh, it was it was tough to like. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of joy in it for me. Yeah, I you know, there's so much about this film, just the the look of the film as I was watching this. It just had this look, I guess the the color palette that uh, he used to shoot it, the costuming, everything just really felt like that late 50s, early 60s sort of thriller, you know, but it, it didn't keep me on the edge of my seat. And I thought I was going to be like, you know, oh, there's some suspense to this, but I just really found myself disappointed. And I, I found it interesting. You're having the same issues I am where we spend time with each of these characters, but there's never any one that we really identify with. Right. You know, to, to really pull us through the story. And it it's and I thought about it and I thought, is it because because these are flawed people that we don't have a traditional heroic figure? I thought, no, 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 I can I can handle the story with an anti hero, but we just had no clear journey that we were following one character along with it. I thought there were there were times where I thought we're seeing too much of this person's story because now I'm identifying with them. If some more of their their story had been hidden from me, then there would have been some mystery around whether it was Chester and Colette about what they were up to and what they were doing, or whether it was Rydal as, you know, sort of the con man, you know, who really who's what were everybody's motives? And because we spent right. so much time with each of them, I thought, okay, I, I don't have any any, I guess, questions to be answered because I I know where everybody's coming from. I I felt. I mean, there's there's shadowy parts to each of their past, but it wasn't anything that really played into the current conflict that we we're being shown in the story. Right, and you know, I think that's interesting because uh, I, I'm glad you bring up frame of reference because I hadn't thought about that either, and that's kind of jarring when you're moving from back and forth. Did have you seen all of Talented Mr. Ripley? Or do you know any of Highsmith's other stuff? I I saw that you know when it first came out on video and it was one that i i saw and thought eh, it's just 
wasn't for me, really, and I, I haven't read any of her novels. I do know that she, I think she had written uh, Strangers on a Train, you know, oh, Hitchcock. So, okay. yep. you know, it's. I think there may be something in the story that's there. I think the translation to film can be the challenge, because I think in her novels, what I hear people like about, about it and... Um, is the character pieces. And there was, uh, I was looking into this one and I even found, you know, a quote from our writer director here, Hossein Amini saying, it was the only book I've ever adapted that I felt compelled to direct, mostly because I recognize so many of the characters, emotional contradictions and shortcomings in myself. Highsmith has an uncanny ability to shine a light on the parts of ourselves we'd rather hide, especially the indignity of human emotions and behavior. And to me, that's really this, internal piece that you can get through a novel of getting into someone's head, their internal conflicts. And it's really hard to externalize that in a film. Yeah. And I think that's one place where this film particularly failed because I didn't really feel the emotions of the characters. I wasn't connected to the emotions of the characters at any given time. There was the drama of the Rydell character and mourning his father in a very conflicted way. There was the idea of Chester as this sort of, um, this sort of white collar con man who, uh, who has some level of jealousy slash morality, but is also willing to, to sort of fool people that way. There's all these different things. And then, you know, and he was in some ways devoted to his wife. I just, I, I wasn't sure where to go with it in terms of their emotional connection. And so for one scene, you know, jumping right into spoilers, you know, when, when Colette dies, I think that's a scene where Viggo Mortensen as Chester does a great job of, 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 of pumping up the emotion. And I actually felt, felt connected to him in that moment. However, if I look at the film at, at holistically and think of who Chester is as a character, I didn't get that. And, and, and that's the sort of the varied texture of each of these characters actually kind of watered down the film a little bit for me because I couldn't really pick a lane on where they were going and, and who, who was the right person, who, who, which person was in the right. And that might be by design at looking at the story and looking at the kind of stories that uh, Patricia Highsmith writes. Well, I, I think... You know, yeah, that's that's the challenge. And I went to sort of look at the film as a whole, and I said, okay, let me do first shot, last shot. Maybe that's going to give me a frame of reference to look at whose story, you know, the film is trying to maybe put forth. And that sort of illuminated something for me that I, I didn't expect, because I, I was in the same position you were, where I felt there were strong moments where I was identifying with each character, especially early on Chester when he's confronted by the private detective and there's that that tussle in the bathroom and he the, the detective you know is accidentally killed by Chester and that you start to sympathize with him because now okay I've got this dead private detective in my bathroom and yes it's clear he's you know a con man who's get, been scamming people but you figure he's sort of that gentleman thief and he's 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 not all bad he wants to be doing the right things but it's just those moments Right. And so I thought, okay, let's step back. The opening scene though is Rydell at the in, in Greece there and he's, you know, got some tourists there and he's he's telling us a story uh about uh Theseus, you know, coming back and they're just telling about mythology. And you're like, Okay, you start to get introduced to him early on. And there's some early scenes with him where uh he's sort of pulling it looks like a money changing scam where he's going to make some change. So you figure, okay, he's sort of this shady guy, but he's, you know, he seems likable enough. And then our... He's our art, artful dodger. Our yeah. Artful dodger. The last shot of the film is him walking out of the cemetery at the end. So we begin and end with him. So I thought, okay, this... Is that going to help me center on his story, his journey? And maybe this is more about the transformation, if any, that he goes through which comes back to the issue of, you know, his relationship with his father, which is brought up several times. And that was one of the things he mentions that Chester sort of reminds him of his father. And that's, that's mentioned throughout. So is it, is it his story in, in dealing with his father? I don't know. Cause I just, I didn't get enough into him. Well, looking at first shot, last shot, I guess we have to, we have to do that, but they didn't make that turn for us in the movie. No, no, they, they didn't. Yeah. And that's, that was the the whole I guess challenge with this is I thought if if I'm if I'm going to sympathize with him more than to not see Chester fighting with the private detective and then when Rydell comes back to the the hotel to return the bracelet and then Chester 
you know, telling him, hey, I need you to help me out. That would put me in a very interesting situation of, well, how much can I trust this Chester character? Did he really, did he kill this guy? Is he, you know, that that's going to give me that more suspenseful part of the story that I want. But because I'm seeing everything, I, I don't have any any mystery to solve because I know exactly where everybody's coming from other than I think perhaps as I've said their internal motives for what they're doing which to me are completely obscured I I don't have a sense of why you know Chester's on the run you know he, he clearly he loves his wife but there's just motivations for actions that occur throughout the film that I just couldn't pinpoint because I didn't have a deep enough connection to any one character. Yeah, it's all, it, and it's all very strange. I think it's interesting that it kind of falls into this suspense realm. It didn't feel suspenseful to me as much as it just felt dramatic. And I don't think that's necessarily a problem, but a lot of a lot of descriptions that I see of this film are talking about it as being Hitchcockian or, or being the oh, sort of thing where yeah. you'd feel suspense. And I really didn't get that. Um it didn't. There wasn't any sort of build for me. It was just a bunch of dramatic crises that followed one another, and I was kind of the the only suspense I felt was waiting for the next sort of dramatic, terrible thing to happen, and that didn't <laughs> necessarily build energy for the film, which I think is where it kind of fell flat. And I I, I wondered if it was the execution of that. If okay. this is really a, a first time director not having the visual vocabulary to really articulate some of those emotional turns or the suspense because I, I thought about as I was watching the scene in the airport where Chester buys the tickets he says he's getting the tickets to Germany and then he, he excuses himself to use the restroom and then there's this realization you know, right out opens the briefcase and, or the suitcase and sees there's Colette's like ID clearly he's being set up and so he's he needs to get out of the airport and then he starts seeing you know the police just all over the place and he's trying right. every turn and I thought this should have been this huge suspenseful set piece and it, it it turned out to be like a little two minute sequence of him walking towards somebody there's a police officer okay he turns towards this door or turns toward these stairs there's an officer there oh he just turns and, f- and eventually makes his way out of the terminal and it was such a letdown because i thought this is this is that moment of is he going to get caught is he going to get away what's going to happen and i didn't get that the only mystery the mystery I had was how did Chester get onto that airplane? Because we see him walk <laughs> into the restroom and then we cut to oh, he's on the flight to to some pl- uh, to Right. You know, Istanbul or something like that. I thought, well, how did he exactly. pull that switch off? I think I think it comes down to the the idea of execution there, really, because we aren't we are not in the frame of mind of any of those characters. We're really watching it happen. And something that Hitchcock did better than potentially anybody in history is when someone is is in that sort of pressure cooker situation that Rydell gets in there. He through the use of visual cues and through the use of music and through through the use of lots of different changes and creative ways of showing you what's happening, you feel like you have the anxiety of that character. And that's something that is missing here. But it, again, it's, it's, it's his first time directing. So I, I think, um, you know, I think it, it, it's interesting to see it, but that, but that suspense wasn't part of it in, in any of those scenes in this movie. Now the, the music, the score to this film by Alberto Iglesias, I thought had that, had, it reminded me of a lot of Hitchcock there were parts of it that just it had that it was trying to to I think prompt for those emotional cues and it again it just helped me feel like I was watching a late fifties early sixties like Hitchcockian style type of film but that just fell short of it and I, again it to me if the the if, if you look at any of the stills from this film I mean it's it's beautiful I the, I I love looking at this film. And, and listening to it, I thought this cultivates a certain mood and feeling. But again, I think that it's the overall execution. All the pieces are there. They're just not pulling together. It, it, it felt like an homage, not, not, uh, not another, not a substitute, which I think it needed, it needed more intensity. It needed more creativity in the drama to get there. And it, and it didn't have it. So again, I think you're right. I think it looks great. And I think y- you are sort of, taken back to that to that feeling but it just didn't execute on what it needed to do to actually make it in that kind of quality of a film so we've got three three main actors that are carrying this film so we've got oscar isaac vigo mortensen and kirsten dunst how did you feel about them and their roles in this film as far as what they brought to this as if we look at them individually you know we're saying this isn't all coming together but individually what strengths do you see there 
Well, it's such a good cast, and I actually like the three of them so much in other things that they've done. And I think, I, you know, I don't know that they were cast perfectly in the roles, and I think that might be part of it, for example. I mean, Oscar Isaac is such a likable character in, in all the stuff that we're seeing him in now with, you know, with uh, The Force Awakens and with um, Ex Machina. I, I, you can't yeah. really call him likable, but he's so charismatic in it, yes. right? Yes. So you, you get that, and this is really the opposite of that. And I think if, if he really is to play the Artful Dodger, especially if he's going to be the Artful Dodger that we're going to follow, some of that charisma has got to come to the scene, the, the, the screen. And I didn't, I didn't catch that, which was disappointing. Um, Kirsten Dunst, I, I think she's a miscast. I I, I, you know, I can take her or leave her. I love her in something like Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. I think she fits in that role. But for what they were trying to build with this woman, with Colette, I, I, I think I needed someone who actually appeared more mature or was more of a seductress. And I don't get that from Kirsten Dunst. Viggo, I think, was probably the closest to what the character needed to be because he has that mystery and he carries that mystery in everything that he does. But the mix of them together, it only served to confuse me more. I, I expected more drama than I got. And so it just felt a little bit halfway there on each of them. How did you feel about them? I, I'm pretty much in the same position you are. I, you know, I was reading some, some little interviews and he, uh, the director said that, you know, actually Viggo Mortensen, that was a challenging casting because the character, he said, with Casting Vigo, the character comes off more sort of as this Gatsby esque character. Right. And that's, that's yeah. not, I, get, I guess that's not how he is in the book. So they had to do some adjusting to have somebody that's sort of that charismatic in this, this role. And I thought, okay, that's, that's interesting. So he, you know, had to work within, you know, sort of these, this other, I guess, uh, factor that's brought in the film by casting Vigo Mortensen that's not part of the story and I thought but to me I, I agree I thought it, it he worked well for that type that character type of you know you could see him fitting totally is this the con man that that wants to do the you know he he's got this young wife and he he wants to be the guy that has the money he wants to be the guy that's you know that the that impresses people uh but he can't he's you know he's always sort of behind the eight ball on this. I thought yeah. it, it worked well for him, but I, I think, yeah, Oscar Isaac, it just, it was kind of odd for me because it, it, yeah, I wanted him to be more like a little, and so I, as I was watching it, I thought, is he really scamming these people when he's doing this money change thing? <laughs> yeah. Because he seems like such a nice, likable guy. He wouldn't be really, you know, stealing money from these ni nice young girls. Right. Oscar Isaac wouldn't do that. And, you know, he's, no. okay, he's, you know, there clearly must have been something, you know, his relationship with his father, it's clearly his dad's fault. You know, it's nothing that he's <laughs> done wrong because it's clearly something about his dad. And that's why he's sort of alienated from his father. Clearly his dad is a complete jerk and, and doesn't deserve him as his son. But that just doesn't fit with what we're being presented in the story. And, and yet, that's where the story gets convoluted because, yeah. you know, we're caring about him as he's literally shortchanging everyone he comes in contact with exactly. and feels no remorse to it and really never owns up to it, never needs to. So it's, uh, how do I, how do I feel for him? How do I care about his emotional situation when he continues to do wrong without remorse? It's just, when he first takes them to Crete, I thought he was taking them to I mean, it gave the impression that he was doing it just because they were an easy mark. Right, um, yeah, yeah. And then, and then uh, yeah, it's just, it, it, it's really confusing as an audience member to try to figure out who's who's right and wrong in this. And and, and that might be by uh, on purpose. I mean, honestly, when you when you talk about the way the story goes, they might want these sort of conflicted characters and they want might that confusion might be on purpose, but it was really difficult for me to to jump in and and participate when that was the case for me. Overall, I think we're saying this is a a flawed film. I uh, sure. you know, something I I think maybe perhaps isn't appealing to us. There might be a, an audience out there that, you know, really enjoyed like the talented Mr. Ripley and maybe there's there's something more to this that uh, it's going to appeal to somebody that really enjoyed that film uh, with these characters. And I agree. If you enjoy the the flawed characters and, and sort of seeing them struggle against each other, that this might be something for you. But it just you know didn't really resonate with me. Is there any uh, sort of last last parting comments? Any any positives that you want to highlight out of this that we haven't touched on? 
I think the camera work is really spectacular. And I think you, uh, you also mentioned, you know, sort of the mood that they set with the period piece, the lighting, the colors, everything they did. I think they did all that right. And I would have liked to seen more art, basically, from the camera perspective infused into it. There was a tracking shot that was following the bus away from the first town that we get when we get to Crete. And it, and it, you know, it's tracking and it's up and it's moving. It's got camera motion and that stuff is great. But then they cut it really short. And there were a lot of stuff where it looked like they wanted to make some sort of, uh, allegory out of the Minotaur and the Labyrinth, or you know that that kind of stuff, or really kind of play on the 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 mythology that's talked about in that sort of first shot uh, story of, right. of Theseus, but it never really g- f- was fully executed because it it I think they were trying to it just kind of sprinkle that it was more yeah. for spice, and when I think the difference maybe between the the novel and the and the film is that they might have needed to play those notes a little bit more strongly um, to get those points across. So I really liked those special camera shots. I like that they took the time with that. I think it could have, they could have done so much more with it if they really wanted to add some art to this piece. Well, you you mentioned the, you know, the, the Minotaur and the, the, the mythology stories. And I don't, I'm kind of curious to see if there's more to that in the novel. And maybe there's some of those themes that are, are tying to the characters a little bit more throughout the novel that had to be cut for pacing or, or time. So it's something where I'm considering maybe this is a book worth worth checking out sort of as a, a fall read because there's some, there something that felt very fall. Maybe it's the colors. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, you know, the film, it just felt very much like an autumn, fall type of movie. So I thought, well, this might be a, a nice w- fall, winter read to sort of uh, you know, sit down next to the fire and and uh, get through to sort of go on a journey with these characters. I think there's there's something of interest there, and this is probably one of my biggest frustrations with the movies like this, where there's there seems like there's such potential and it's falling short. And I want so much to to want to really enjoy the film, but it keeps getting in its own way. That well, and that and, and maybe that's because there's a lot of the depth of the book is missed when you translate it to film. Who do you think the two faces of January were? Do you have a sense of of what they're pointing to? I mean, wh- wait, were they characters or were they something else? I, I, you know, and I guess that's, I mean, I guess that's our two men, our two male leads. Must there. be right. It, it's got to be of the the two the two con men, you know. Or in, is it in, Chester and Rydell's dad? Uh, yeah. I, you know, I, I I I sort of came down because I guess near the end, Rydell basically says, you know, he was he really he really was after Colette. You know, yeah. and so it's really, uh, which I didn't get really did strongly. That. And he said that. So maybe it's the, the two con men playing, you know, each other to try to get her. Mm. That's about all I could come up with. If that's the case. Yeah. Not, not clear at all. In general, uh, the, the story couldn't come through in the film as much as it needed to be. And I think you're right. Maybe it is an autumn holiday uh, book uh, read because there there might be a lot more to the novel than was able to be translated on screen. Let's talk about you know where we rank this. So on, okay, on, on your flick chart, where did the two faces of Jan- January end okay, up? I'm looking, and I know it's in my lower side of things, okay. but in, but outside of that, it it actually ended up beating some movies that you wouldn't necessarily think it would. Um, and I think that part of the reason for that is because I do think it's an innovative story that was just executed not as well as as I could have expected. So um, for me, it comes in, uh, interestingly enough, just on in number 97. So that's 97 out of 130. So it's on the it's on the low end, but it comes in just below uh, Odd Thomas, which I think is interesting. I don't think it could beat Odd Thomas. Odd Thomas was much more fun for me. And that's another trailer rewind movie. Um, but it comes in above uh, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, which is... Oh, wow. Uh, a movie that I don't like in particular, um, which is actually also an adapted short story, um, even though I love David Fincher, um, it's it's in that mix there. But I think that there's more to this story, um, and I think that's why it uh, sort of sat in that little spot for me. How about you? So for me, it's it's much farther down. I don't know if I was just feeling really disappointed by the mean. time I got around to, <laughs> to, to ranking this mean and spiteful, but it came in at 201 Whoa. out of 214. So oh, way, wow. That's way, very low. Way, way, way down there. And yeah. let's see, it's, uh, yeah, like I said, I think, I don't know if it was just spiteful ranking or what it just came up against. So it came in at 201. Uh, number 200 is Godzilla, which okay. uh, was film board that I had, I think we all had a lot of issues with that one. And then sure. two, 202 was the, uh, oh, Son of God, 
which was no, from 2014, I don't even know what that is. 2014, you know, one of those faith-based films that just sort of didn't quite pull it together. Um, and then right below that is two, uh, 203 is Jack Ryan Shadow Recruit, another film board disaster. <laughs> so, totally. yeah, it, it's it's in there with some... Now, those are films that I probably will watch, you know, once or twice, you know, down the road sometime. Um, like I said, I, I didn't feel angry about this film. I think I was Until just you more... ranked of, it. Well, you know, feelings of disappointment... But there, there are films that make me outright angry, and we've had discussions about those on the film board of just this. This yep. is making me. Angry. This was just a, a a big disappointment. So that's I think it's well placed where it is. There's the it's the bottom ones are the ones that really make me angry. So if what you know in a star rating to give some you know some listeners some context, where would you? How many stars would you give this out out of a letterboxed five? Where would you place this? I would probably be at two stars for this, and. It, <laughs> You know, I don't feel great about that because that's a really low score. But I think this is like a cheap, uh, and I shouldn't say cheap because I think it costs some money to to make. I think it's a, a, a not as strong, not as deep interpretation of a film. Like we talked about talented Mr. Ripley because it's coming from the same source material, but also something like like Titanic, really, where you have a bunch of characters that are all <laughs> somewhat dislikable, yeah, right, and then you're trying to weave this story between them, and this didn't have the. It didn't have the real sort of execution behind it to make something like this work, um, and I'm a I, you know I don't like Titanic at all, but that's that's why this film it, it still ends up on that low end for me is because all of those negative characters just didn't bring me any sort of real emotion to to my viewing. How about you? What are your star? What's your star rating? Yeah, it's it's a uh, you know I'd give it two stars because it is you know sure. I think below two stars is where I'm in angry. Just this movie just <laughs> makes me angry. This is two stars is that that area of disappointment where it, it could be it could have been better. It's it's something I think worth watching, but ultimately, yeah, it was a it was a disappointment that I'll. I'll probably watch in a few years thinking, well, maybe I misjudged it. Maybe it's going to take a second view and maybe I'll discover something and it'll it'll lure me in with that. And then then at that point, maybe I'll be angry. I, I, I think the only reason I'd watch it is is if I wanted to recommend it to someone who enjoyed movies like that, like The Talented Mr. Ripley, because otherwise I don't think I'll come back to it. Maybe Andy's what? a person for that, though. Oh, maybe. Right? <laughs> Because yeah. Andy was interested in it, and because he probably liked the talented Mister Ripley, he he. Did, but the interesting thing was, he said he saw it when it first came out, but he he hadn't like seen it since or revisited it. So I, I I'd be interested to see where he if he watched goes back and watch Ripley again, where that falls for him now, uh, and to see where this one might stack up compared to Talented Mister Ripley for him. Let's let's get him to watch this one first. Okay, and then maybe that'll inspire him to go. Wait, was Ripley really what I thought it was? <laughs> I don't, we might and have to strap him down him. to make him get through all of this one. Maybe a little coffee <laughs> on a Saturday <laughs> afternoon. Okay, yep, that's the right choice. <laughs> all, all right. right. Well, you know, here at the next reel, we say that when the movie ends, the conversation begins, and I've really enjoyed our talk about the two faces of January. But now the conversation is ending, and it's time to go start another movie. 